for internships i would say the range of pay is between 3 to 4000 dollars a week and for full time i think with your signing bonus and bonus it can go up to anywhere between 220 to 280 for the bei i would say they ask you a behavioral question the time you had an issue with a manager for example and they you know answer the question and normally in most business schools they move on to the next question but at sloan they will spend a lot of time asking follow up questions specifically around how you felt during that how do you think your manager felt what could you have done better so being ready to answer some of these follow up questions is i think something that people should keep in mind Welcome to another episode of Crack the MBA show. Our guest today is Swaraj Dharia who is a first year student at MIT Sloan School of Management. Prior to Sloan, Swaraj worked as a management consultant, focused on tech strategy and then moved on to carbon market negotiations for the government of India. Swaraj was the youngest negotiator for the Indian government at UN's climate change conferences COP26 and COP27. before moving into an early stage climate vc role at peak ventures in bombay swaraj is focused on driving private capital towards climate mitigation and adaptation while balancing financial returns in his free time swaraj is thinking about starting his own company playing or watching soccer or trying to learn a new musical instrument at sloan swaraj is in charge of external relations at the pvc club and working on a startup under mit sandbox innovation fund Suraj also recently helped with the MIT Sloan Energy and Climate Conference. Welcome Suraj, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for the introduction. Look, we're happy to be here. Lovely. Suraj to begin, we have a tradition here. So can you tell our audience a fun fact about yourself? Yeah, a fun fact about me is that I used to be a child actor doing regional theater in Maharashtra growing up and I did that for about 4 to 5 years before then moving on to other hobbies and passions. Oh lovely lovely and is that theater that you were participating in Yeah mostly regional theater we did like traveling troops as well so it was a good time oh, like fun. second grade to sixth grade Okay wow that's quite a unique fun fact super and speaking a little bit more about childhood right uh, Swaraj can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and you know the important influences you've had growing up Absolutely. So I grew up in a small town on the western coast of India called Mahat. And one of the biggest influences or influential figures I've had in my life was my grandfather. He did not have access to education, but was still able to successfully start his own business, although a small scale business, and do really well and be successful over the years and provide for all of us growing up. and that was something that i always sort of took with me throughout my career and life also i spent a lot of my growing up years in boarding school in panchgani in maharashtra and being there at a young age around third grade was something that really helped me become adaptable helped me understand that you know the world is always bigger than what you know and those have been kind of the most sort of influential childhood experiences that i've had love it i think grandparents play such a major role in our development and that's something something i absolutely love about growing up in india we really get yeah. spoiled because of that and boarding school definitely sounds like a unique journey i've never mm-hmm. been to a boarding school but i really envy people who've had that opportunity yeah yeah it's not fun the first year or so when you're trying to settle in but it gets better i can promise you that lovely how, how long were you at boarding school for i was there for 4 years okay and it was mainly an effort on my mom's part to give me better access to education which we didn't have in a small town and the fact that you know in that boarding school we had people from all over the world it really helped me expand my sphere of what i know about the world and how i fit in or don't want to put them in different spheres okay kudos to your mom for doing that lovely okay and suraj can you also talk about your winning habits that have led to all your successes in various areas when i think about winning habits the only thing that comes to my mind is something that 
was told to me growing up by my parents as well as, you know, the influence I've had of my grandfather in my life is that you can't always be the smartest person in a room, but you can be the most hardworking. And I think that perseverance and hard work is something that I've always imbibed in whatever I did. So be it getting into consulting and then pivoting straight into a job in the government of India, working in carbon markets, which I didn't have exposure to before doing the job, right? And using just the fact that, okay, I need to work harder. I need to make sure that I understand it more than anybody else. And, you know, working with people who had been doing it for like 30 years or more, this ideal of value of perseverance and hard work is something that I think has really helped me in my career. And I hope it will go forward as well. I'm sure. And I think one other way in which this perseverance shows up is through the reapplication process that you went through, right? So it'd be great if you could speak about your application process, right? Like the first time around Mm -hmm. and then the second time around and what you did differently. Sure, yeah. So the first time around, I applied the year I had moved back to India. And I did not have any professional and help in my moved app. back to India from where? Oh, from my job in New York where I was doing consulting. Okay. So I had just moved back after three years in consulting in about May 2021. And I decided to apply in September round one, 2021 to business schools, not knowing how rounds work, not knowing how, you know, you would evaluate schools or that essays take time. And for me, I kept thinking that, okay, business school applications would be like master's applications, which will be one essay, maybe a recommendation or two. And that's about it. I had no idea about the reflection and the time it takes for every application. So I knew eight business schools. That's all my research was, schools that I'd heard about. So I went through round one, just applying last day. I was very lucky to have relationships at EY where I used to do consulting, but they were okay doing recommendations last minute for me. And I just applied to eight schools last minute, not really reflecting as much. And through that process, I got waitlisted somehow at MIT and at Dartmouth. I got rejected everywhere else, like all the other M7s. By round three, in 2022, I was invited to interview by MIT. And after the interview, it didn't work out. And I was completely distraught, to be quite honest, because I didn't know where I should be going now. It was already around May. So I started thinking about, oh, do I just want to be in India? Do I let go of this MBA dream? But then I found some help in a mentor who helped me through the application process. We reapplied this time with additional, like we were very strategic, we were very risk averse and applied to some schools in round one, kept some schools for round two and finally was able to crack a few of them. Okay. But the journey of reflection and really looking back at our careers and what we've achieved and what has led to some decisions that we've taken in the past was something that I hadn't done the first time around. And I think that's what differentiated my application between the two rounds. Understood. Two. Yeah. And we can probably take the example of MIT, since that's where you also reapplied and found success the second time around, right? Yeah. So what did the first application focus on? And then we can talk about the second application. We'll talk about the different components a little bit deeper for the second one. Sure. So for MIT, the first application, because I was doing it on my own and I did the cover letter last minute, it was more of a run through of my resume that I had in consulting and had only spent about two months in the government by the time I'd applied, two or three months. So I didn't really have deep stories or any achievements as such to mention. So the cover letter wasn't nuanced. It was very much like a walkthrough of the resume. My video was, again, a walkthrough of my resume, but in a different format. I hadn't really developed stories that I wanted to talk about and, you know, give the outcome a holistic view of my profile. And also, I think my score was okay. I had struggled a bit with GMAT, balancing that with work, with applications. So I had around a 720 in the GMAT. And uh, I think... That was the first time application, like just nothing but the resume and talking about the projects I've done in consulting. Okay, understood. And then maybe we can delve a little deeper into your second application, right? So can you speak about how you structured your cover letter, what anecdotes you highlighted? So the second time around, I actually made an Excel sheet with all of my experiences in one column and what I wanted to highlight in the column booths, right? Right. 
And what I did was through the cover letter, I spoke about a few things that I had done in the government and UI and really focused on the motivation behind doing certain projects or the motivation behind the move that I had made in my career, on the career, which I think added a lot more depth to my application than it did in the year before. Yeah. Can you give us I an s- example of that? Yeah. So, for example, for the government piece, I could finally talk about negotiating on behalf of India at COP26 and 27 by the second time around. I was helping launch the domestic carbon market, the green credit program. By the time I applied and I went into the interview, I knew that I was probably getting this VC job in Bombay. So I had that to talk about. And I could see that I had a thread of stories that I had developed. And I had strong motivations behind the projects that I had taken up, be it in the government or be this new move to VC. And highlighting all of those, mentioning the need for climate and how my childhood growing up in a climate affected town has driven me towards all of these projects was something that really stood out, I think, in my application the second time around. Okay, that's helpful. That does make it more real for us. And before we delve into some of the other pieces of the application, can you speak about what are the elements that give a Sloan cover letter its wow factor? You know, is there a common structure that people mm-hmm. employ? I don't want to say there's a common structure that people employ, but I think Sloan and the AdCom, from what I've learned talking to my friends here now, is that they really do focus on the past a lot and your achievements in the past as an indicator of what you can do in the future. So the cover letter has to be focused on what you've done in the past, your achievements, and thinking about them, not just from, okay, if I made a model for the government of India, just mentioning that I made a model is not enough. You know, having thought about it in terms of its impact across different levels, that I made a model that led to this happening for the government, which led to this happening at negotiations. And this was the impact it had at the UN level on some of the things that I've done. That kind of reflection, I think, really adds a lot of that wow factor to the cover letter. Also, a very important thing that now that I've interacted with some people from the AdCom is mentioning motivations. A lot of us change careers. A lot of us switch jobs before we apply to business schools. The motivation doesn't have to be something that's epic or awesome, you know. It just has to be something that means something to you and you're able to put it into words and really have depth of thinking on why you decided to make a certain change or why you decided to take up a certain project and where it was leading you and how it was leading you towards your goal. I think that's what adds a lot of the wow factor to your cover letter. Okay, that's really helpful and insightful. One follow-up question on that, Swaraj. So in the application form, a lot of times we also get to answer reason for leaving a job, right? Or reason for joining a company. So sometimes candidates are confused when they're talking about that already in the application form. How do they balance talking about their motivations in such components as well, like the cover letter motivations? So that's a great question because the cover letter at Sloan is famously, the real estate is really constrained and balancing mentioning your achievements along with your motivations is always a tough part. So the way I had thought of this was if I have 10 stories that I want to display or put in front of the ad com, I select two or three of them for the cover letter. So I had some real estate in terms of talking about my achievements to these two or three stories and having some space left for my motivations. And then through my video, through additional essays, I was able to put forth some of the other stories that I decided not to. Because one thing that I had done my first time around where I got wasn't successful was I tried to fit everything into the cover letter. So instead of really having stories that were built out that spoke about what I exactly did, what was the impact of what I did. It was just a list almost of A, B, C, and D. And now I want to come to slow. But this time around, was I did A because I wanted to do X. And this led to one, two, three impacts. And then I did B. So just pulling out stories and really going deep into them. And you don't have to have a lot of stories for your cover letter. There is not enough space. But balancing that, I think, really helps. Very helpful. And you talked about something, Swaraj, which... I want to bring up again, right, that Sloan focuses a lot on past actions, right? Mm -hmm. And that was a great quote, past actions are best predictors of future success. I've heard that numerous times as well from Sloan's adcom. Now, one thing that candidates also wonder about is whether or not they should touch upon their goals, because those aren't asked anywhere in Sloan's application, if they should touch upon those in the cover letter or elsewhere. So what's your take on that? 
So for me, I hadn't particularly mentioned my goal in my cover letter or my video. But I think when you talk about your experiences and when you mention your motivations for some of those experiences, your goal kind of comes through your story. So when I'm talking about I'm helping negotiate for carbon markets or I'm helping set up a domestic carbon market to get financing into India, the goal does come through that, okay, this person seems to be someone who wants to work in climate finance or wants to go towards that. I mean, I know people who did mention their goals in their cover letter, but for me personally, I hadn't explicitly mentioned it anywhere. And even in the interview, I mean, we'll get to that, but it was never asked what my goal was from. Understood. Okay, so what I'm hearing is it's not a requirement and people do find success even without talking about their goals. Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, so moving on to the introduction video, right? Can you yeah. speak about how you approached that? Sure, yeah. So that was actually, I think, one of the trickiest things about the Sona application process because you get one minute and if I remember correctly, the prompt is to introduce yourself to your class, not to the IACOM. So the way I had done it was, as I said, I had stories that I had built out and I decided to pull a few stories into the video. But when I started talking about it, it started feeling very professional and I didn't feel like my personality was coming through in what I was talking about. So the way I approached the video was I just took a camera and I started speaking into it as if I'm actually meeting people from my class for the first time. And I did like multiple recordings of about two minutes, three minutes. And I saw that, okay, there are some things that I genuinely want to speak about through those multiple recordings. And then I wrote those down and I finally did my one minute video. But honestly, it ended up having nothing to do with any of my professional or career achievements or journey at all. It was mainly me talking about what I like to do, what my hobbies are, or how I like to be in teams and things like that. I did mention a little bit about having worked across consulting policy and investing. But I think that was the only part where I touched upon anything to do with my career. It was very personal. It was just me talking almost to a friend and introducing myself for a minute. Okay, that does sound like something one would use for an actual introduction with a classmate. So yeah. That's nice. I really like that. And what advice do you have for applicants in creating an impactful video introduction? The first advice, and this will sound extremely cliche, is to be yourself. But being yourself is easy to say. And the way I did it to get to really understand what I want to tell people is to just take a camera and speak into it, really. Nothing at stake, just talking to a camera and no time limit and actually feeling like you're talking to a friend from you know, the slow note or the class, right? And that really helps bring out the things that you really want to talk about or you really want to tell people about yourself. And most of the times you don't want to talk about your career the first time you meet someone. You want to talk about who you are as a person, what you like doing, what you do in your free time. I was talking about making Spotify playlists in my Sloan video essay because I, I really enjoy doing that and finding songs. So getting those things out and mentioning those in your video will really add to outcome getting a holistic perspective and even you really truly understanding what really means to you and matters to you when you're speaking to someone from the class. Okay, that's helpful. Thanks for sharing that, Swaraj. And Swaraj Sloan also has a diversity and inclusion prompt as part of the application. So yeah. how did you approach that prompt and what advice do you have for applicants there? So for me, for that prompt, I had a few experiences. One was starting a women empowerment focused nonprofit, which was which is called Vilasa, helping women across India or starting with Rupal Maharashtra gain financial independence. And we had started a recruitment drive at the government of India, uh, wherein female consultants never really wanted to go on field because of a lack of the right infrastructure, as well as the whole environment. So we had started a drive to sort of address that. So between these two stories, I decided to talk about the government one because it seemed more relevant and more recent to what I had experienced. And the way I approached it was, honestly, I spoke to a few people in the government who were my colleagues who had gone through the program that we had started, got some of their inputs in terms of how they felt about it, why did they decide to join it. And then the essay was a basic star format in terms of this is what the issue was, this is what we did, this was what the result was. And highlighting the result in this case, because with DEI, a lot of times there are a lot of projects that people try and do. 
but the results aren't always the best. So I focus more on highlighting the results of what had happened and quantifying as much as I could around the number of consultants that were going out, how they were feeling. I was asking really vague questions to them during interviews about how do you feel about it on a scale of one to 10 with no real definition of the scale, but just to get an idea of what the overall sentiment was. And I poured all of that into that essay. And I would say most of the real estate went towards highlighting the result and the impact that our program had on the government. Okay, very helpful. Thanks, Swaraj. And yeah. moving to an important part of the application process, right? The interview. So mm-hmm. can you share your Sloan interview experience, including the two additional prompts that one has to tackle after being invited to interview? Yeah. So once you get invited to interview, you have the DEI prompt that we spoke about. And the second one is a data example. I don't remember the prompt exactly, but it's about a piece of data that really matters to you and why. And that really stumped me initially because they're okay with you finding a data set from your work or something off of the internet. One of the most important things for me was during negotiation, we had used a lot of data to convince and talk to different countries. And using that to show how we as India were able to bring on different countries on our side of the negotiation, be it the BRICS countries or be it the like-minded developing country group. So I focused on that. And the way I broke down the story for the data set was honestly just talking about why we created the data set in the first place, why it mattered, and then how it helps me personally feel about reaching some of my goals or that piece of data helped us get there. That's how I approached it. Coming to the interview itself, it's a 30-minute behavioral interview, quite standard, honestly. No questions are asked that are very unique to Sloan as such. Although most questions are behavioral and looking at your past, I haven't met anyone who was asked a goals question or very few people are even asked the why MBA question, to be quite honest. One question that the Sloan interview does start with, and it's been, it has happened to everyone is, what has changed since you applied? Or if you're a re-applicant, what has changed since you last applied? And that was uh, something that I wasn't prepared for. And it's important to think about maybe in round one, you apply by September and then you're interviewing in November. Not a lot changes in two months. So thinking about that, and I would recommend not saying that nothing has changed, but it can be something as simple as, you know, at work, I'm doing a new project. Or personally, I finally ran the 10K or the 11K. It it can be anything, but there has to be something there. The interview, uh, from what I've heard also, and it happened to me as well, sometimes ends abruptly. So mine ended in 22 minutes. And I thought that I hadn't done well because it ended early. But I wouldn't think of that as a metric at all in evaluating how we did. Other than that, most of the questions, like I said, are behavioral, looking at the past and nothing, nothing out of the ordinary. Okay. Sloan has this philosophy of having a behavioral and event-based interview, right? Or BEI. So what exactly does that mean? And how does one prepare for an interview like that? Yeah, so for the BEI, I would say they'll ask you a behavioral question, the time you had an issue with a manager, for example. And they you answer a question and normally in most business schools, they move on to the next question. But at Sloan, they will spend a lot of time asking follow-up questions, specifically around how you felt during that. How do you think your manager felt? What could you have done better? So being ready to answer some of these follow-up questions is, I think, something that people should keep in mind when going through the Sloan interview. And sometimes you won't even hit more than four questions and you spend time talking about three or four questions. But the follow-on questions is what the adcom really wants to get into. Again, to the point of understanding your motivations, your feelings, and how you handle some of these situations. And also they ask you how you think the other person felt in some situations to gauge how you think about things emotionally and intellectually as well. Okay, understood. So basically what I'm hearing is that you should really dig deep into your anecdotes as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as long as you have spent enough time reflecting on that anecdote, I mean, just close your eyes and live through it one more time. I think you'll be fine to answer most of the questions that come has. 
Okay. And did you do that level of digging when you were preparing for the interview? Were you expecting that? I had heard that there'll be follow-up questions in a Stone interview. And for me, because of my structure of using a spreadsheet to write my anecdotes down and then diving deeper, I had a decent handle on the reflection part of it, at least on most of the anecdotes that I mentioned. Okay. Got it. So all the pre-work that you did was helpful for you already. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Understood. And given the admissions officer would have read your entire application prior to interviewing you, how does that change the interview experience? So personally, for me, they didn't ask any specific questions from my cover letter or chart or the video. There were questions about my DEI and data essay that we write just before the interview. And the questions are quite high level. So for me, the question was around, hey, can you walk me through your data essay again and explain it to me better? Which I honestly wasn't expecting going in. But because you spend so much time, like 24 hours before the interview, writing that essay, it's not a huge lift to talk about it and explain it to someone. I have spoken to people here who are asked about the DEI essay in depth with follow-up questions and again the questions about why did the motivation behind some of the decisions they made or why they even started sort of programs so i would definitely prepare for that okay all right that's helpful and i've also heard that there's a preference for anecdotes from the past three years how true is that i think it is true and in a way i think the best way to have a very strong anecdote that you can talk about in depth is that it is from recent past. That's also one of the reasons why I decided in my DEI essay to talk about what we did in the government more than me starting a nonprofit with my colleagues because that happened way back in the past. And I wouldn't say that having something from further back would affect the outcome's perception, but I think it would impact the applicant in terms of making sure they have all of the in-depth sort of, you know, motivations, feelings, and enough to reflect upon in terms of what they've done. Yeah, that makes sense. And I also feel that people evolve over time. Mm -hmm. So who you were more than three years ago might be very different from who you are today. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great point. That's also so true. Yeah. So Swaraj, in your view, what's the admissions committee's evaluation criteria? The evaluation criteria for Sloan, I would say they honestly walk the talk in terms of the prompt that they have for the cover letter about principled innovative leaders who are okay taking risks and I'm paraphrasing the, the prompt is huge, but I think that really matters to Sloan. Most people that I meet in my class are people who have taken some form of risks in their careers or who have really gone out of their way to do things that will mean a lot to them. And I think that is something that really matters to the Sloan Icom. I know the perception when I was applying was your academics, especially for MIT, it's, oh, you need to have a stellar GPA, you need to have a great standardized testing score. But I, I don't think that matters as much. And don't quote me on that, but I didn't have a stellar GPA. I didn't have a great standardized testing score. And a lot of people here are also in the same boat. But everyone who's here has done something, gone out of the way to do something that means a lot to them, even if it's going outside of their job and starting a nonprofit or just being great in their careers and really, you know, just being smart and doing really well in their careers, working hard. So you'll see all kinds of people. And I I wouldn't say that they look for anything specific that, hey, this is the mold that an MIT student should be. Also, I think the behavioral interview really helps them in filtering out candidates wherein everyone here is super community oriented really helpful and Sloanies helping Sloanies is a real thing where they want to get people in who would make sure that you know you look at the world as a positive sum game so you make sure you help everyone around you and what I have noticed is everyone here is extremely extremely cheering on for you and even if you're applying for the same job or for the same fellowship I don't know if that answers the question but Yeah, that's really helpful. Thanks. Uh, It helps us understand what the culture is like also. Yeah. And speaking about the mission a little bit, right? Because you touched upon it as well. Uh, The mission is to develop principled, innovative leaders who improve the world and to generate ideas that advance management practice. So how does this mission manifest or translate into the program, the curriculum, the activities and that sort of thing? Yeah, so the program itself is designed for people to 
continually be pushed outside of their comfort zones. So we in the core semester that we have, which was my last semester, wherein you have a whole lot of credits that you need to solve for. You have assignments, projects, and you have to work with your core team. So it's almost like a semester-long team project, wherein you really learn to work with people from different environments, different backgrounds, learn from different perspectives. No two people in a core team at Stone and they do a really good job of it, have the same sort of life experience or career experience. Everyone's come from very diverse backgrounds and you learn to work with them. There's also a huge push towards leadership and DEI and improving emotional intelligence. So for example, in the fall, we have something called Lead Week where you have a week off and all you do is throughout the week take leadership classes that are provided through Sloan or through partner organizations that help you with things like building teams, communicating effectively on top of the communications class that you have. And that really speaks to Sloan's mission of developing leaders that really want to advance management. There is also a massive push for entrepreneurial thinking across the program. So in my experience, if I meet 10 people at Sloan, I think five or six of them are working on a startup or are working on something maybe seriously on a startup or at least on the side and thinking about starting a company. And that speaks a lot to the school's push towards you starting something of your own, solving for problems on your own. And it's not to say that everyone, the school wants everyone to be an entrepreneur, but there's all the classes and the way electives are designed. You start thinking in a way of, okay, how do I solve problems? Maybe it's as being part of a larger organization or on your own, and how do you build towards actually solving them? So the school's motto of men's at manus, which is mind and hand, is something that I have seen really put in practice. And that's also something that's very unique to MIT, where we have a lot of classes which we call labs, which are hands-on learning classes. So for example, the month of January, MIT doesn't have classes. We have something called the independent activities period, where you're free to do whatever you want. So you can go back home, you can work on a startup, or you can do one of the many labs that the school has. So I did finance lab, for example, which was actually working with a VC based out of New York on solving a real problem. There are people who put an operations lab where they work with like massive companies in the US and solving a actual operations issue. And that's just in IAP, but also in spring, there are labs with or entrepreneurship lab where you work with a startup as an operator throughout the semester, helping them scale, raise funding, solve a problem, maybe hire the right kind of people or plan a go-to-market strategy. So those kind of things are really unique and really speak to MIT's push towards their mission of the kind of people that they want graduating out of the program. Okay, that's really insightful. Thanks for sharing that, Swaraj. Um, We will touch upon some of these aspects a little bit more. But before doing that, I also wanted to get an understanding about what are the major events through the year that attract maximum attendance and excitement? Yeah, that's a a great question. So I would actually divide events at Sloan as cultural events. And then there are professional conferences, right? So cultural events at Sloan are called C functions or cultural functions. And they happen almost every two weeks. So different clubs plan them. So during Diwali, there's the the Diwali C function. But this week on Thursday, tomorrow, we have the Brazil C function. So you have these C functions that happen every two weeks, which have massive attendance. And it's like cultural immersion along with like a whole social event where you get to meet people outside of the classroom in a very relaxed setting. And I've always seen major attendance across all of them. From a conference perspective, specifically in spring, we have the months of February and March are extremely busy. You'll have a conference, I would say like four conferences a week. So it could be something like the MIT, like the ones we did with the Energy Club. It can be the sports conference that happens. Then there's an AI conference, product management conference. So all of that see a lot of attendance from students who are interested in those, as well as from outside, where we have a lot of people coming in from HVS. For the MIT Energy Conference, we had volunteers who had come from like McCombs and really business schools that are not around Boston. So these things really see a lot of attendance. Also. We do a lot of student-run treks at MIT. During spring break, we went to Columbia and it was 150 or I think 120 of us that went to Columbia. And that was actually a really good time. 
where you're away from business school, you're with your friends and just, you know, exploring a new culture. Fun. That sounds amazing. And that, yeah. that's a lot of conferences. And you said they're mostly in Feb and March. Is there a reason why that happens? I think it's a function of time because first years come in in August. You join a club and you spend fall planning for a conference and it comes into fruition around February or March. And yeah. there's a conference literally for any and every professional or career interest that you may have. And so there's a big conference have, culture. Yeah. And sometimes it does happen in conjunction. Some of them happen in conjunction with HPS as well. So you get a larger network and a larger What's conference. an example of such a conference that's jointly uh, So there was an India conference that happened recently. It happens at HBS, but a lot of MIT people are involved in it in terms of helping plan it, in terms of helping create the agenda, get speakers on board, it, etc. Oh, okay. And wow. I like the collaboration. Yeah. And very recently, uh, there was an AI MLL conference that happened between HBS and MIT where a lot of MIT graduates have done really well in AI. And also Sloanies are also uh, huge in that field. So HBS and MIT, they tend to come together on things where, you know, a lot of technology and business needs. And it helps you also exponentially get access to a network that you wouldn't just get more than what you'd get from Oxford. That makes sense. Very smart. And Suraj, can you speak about the Cambridge location and how that enhances the Sloan experience? Absolutely. So I think being in Cambridge it really adds to going to business school in the area because it is like the hub for innovation, specifically for healthcare and biotech. There's no better place, I think, in the world to be than in Boston and Cambridge. But also for me personally, from a VC perspective or for people from a tech perspective, you have all of those companies in and around the Boston Cambridge area. And I think a lot of business school is about networking. And on top of attending in-school events, you get access to all of these events happening outside of school. So there could be a founders and investors meetup happening somewhere in Boston. And because it's in Boston, they always have a certain quota of tickets open to students wherein you can always go and attend those conferences, meet people outside of your MBA bubble, get an idea of what's happening around the industry. And the second aspect of it is as in the VCP club, for example, where we try to get speakers, give everyone at Sloan a wide sort of buffet of, okay, this is all that you can do in venture capital. So it's easier to get those speakers to come to campus. It's easier to get a wide variety of, okay, just in venture capital, these are the different ways you can think about it. And for every particular way or every stage or every kind of investment thesis, being in Cambridge really helps get those kind of people to come to Sloan and really get people uh, the exposure they need to all of these different things. Okay, that's cool. And can you speak about housing? So where do you live and where do students mostly live? What's housing priced at? That sort of thing. Yeah, absolutely. So most students live around Central Square or Kendall Square in Cambridge. Central Square is actually central. So it's like a 20 minute walk to MIT and a 20 minute walk to Harvard. Kendall Square is where Sloan is at. And a lot of students prefer staying there because it's a shorter walk to Sloan. The rents are extremely high in the Boston and Cambridge area. The school does provide student housing, although it's limited, and it's almost one of first come first serve basis. So your internet and your luck has to be on the A game to get student housing, which is subsidized. But in terms of rates, I mean, they depend on the kind of housing you look for. So if you want a luxury building with I don't know, uh, concierge, laundry in the building, then even for one bed, you'd be looking at paying around $2,500 to $3,000 a month. If you're open to sharing, you can go somewhere in the range of $1,200 to $1,800, $2,000, depending on how many people you could share the apartment with. Okay, that's helpful. And what about the subsidized housing? How's that priced? So subsidized housing is, I would say, about 30% cheaper, what you get at in the Cambridge area. And it also comes furnished, so you don't have that expense on top of actually paying the rent. Okay, yeah, that sounds very useful as well. And yeah. what about food, right? How's food on campus and in Boston? You know, what are your favorite eating joints? And what are the good Indian options? Sure, yeah. So the food in Cambridge is great. Indian food is not as great. It won't even come close to 
Indian standards or even what you get in cities like New York or San Francisco, for example. Good food options around campus are mainly like for fast food. You have places like Chipotle or Kava where you get bowls, which are healthy and have like macros. A lot of students tend to go for a lot of student events. The food that's provided is mostly pizzas because it's easier and the density of pizza restaurants is extremely higher on Cambridge. But overall, in terms of food options, you'll find every cuisine. It's just up to your subjective standard where certain cuisines should be. You will find major differences. Specifically about Indian food, it isn't that great. There are some good places that have opened up recently, like there's a new place that has opened up in Kendall Square that I'm yet to try, but I've heard good things about. So it's constantly changing, but I wouldn't say you'll be short on options, but like in Boston, especially if you go out of Cambridge and go to like a larger Boston area, you have amazing options. Indian food, although, is something that you hear every Bostonian complain about. That's surprising. And yeah. otherwise, like outside of Indian food, what are some of your favorite restaurants or like some student favorites yeah sure so one restaurant that we tend to go to all the time is in Cambridge it's called Mad Monkfish and Mad it's mainly, Monkfish Mad Monkfish and okay. it's mainly like seafood focused Asian food there's also a really good Thai restaurant called Pepper Sky which we've gone to a bunch of times a lot of time though is spent going to Chipotle just for a quick like snack or a quick meal between classes the Sloan Cafe itself is also really great they have a lot of options they have like changing stations so one day you'll have an Indian food station and one day you'll have Italian food stations etc although uh, it isn't the most pocket friendly but the Sloan Cafe itself how so much lot, uh, can you expect to spend on a meal anywhere between like 15 to 20 dollars for a proper meal and yeah that's a lot to be spending every day for one meal after like I think you come in August and around October you'll see a lot of people starting to bring their own food because you start settling into a routine of like meal prepping, cooking, things like that. So you'll see that happen as well. But yeah, there are I can keep going about restaurants. So there's one Korean keep going about restaurants. So there's one Korean barbecue place that we tend to always go to for like hot pot or just a basic Korean barbecue. So options are honestly endless in okay. Cambridge. All right, yeah. that's nice. And uh, Suraj, can you speak about the activities that you've been involved with at Sloan outside the classroom? You know, we can talk about the VCP club, the Sandbox Innovation Fund, as well as the Energy and Climate Conference. Sure. Yeah. So for the VCP club, I used to work in VC, so it was I always wanted to join it. And the activities that we do for the club are mainly around two things. So one is around getting access to career opportunities. And second is about educating students around what it means to be. And the thing with venture is it's broken up across different stages. You could want to be an early stage. You want to be a late stage. You want to be climate focused, generalist. So as a club, what we try to do is we try to get speakers to campus for fireside chats, small group discussions, lunch and learns across the spectrum of venture capital. We also tie up a lot with the entrepreneurship club, wherein we get VCs focus solely on helping startup founders think about scaling their businesses. They also get startup founders, like successful startup founders themselves, but you also try to get VCs here to show the other side of the table and their perspective. From a learning perspective, we are in the process of starting a weekly sort of event where you come in and you learn different things about VCs. Okay, how do you write a call memo? How do you write an investment memo? How do you build an investment thesis for an interview? What are different things that you should be aware of? Things like that. So that's what we do on the VCPE side. The Sandbox Innovation Fund is something that I'm actually quite excited about at MIT, wherein you apply with a business idea and you get funding anywhere between $500 to $25,000. And you spend the semester working on that idea. And you get a mentor who you meet with every two weeks who are successful entrepreneurs who have exits or people who are entrepreneurs in residence here at the MIT Trust Center. The way they do it is they almost make starting your own company like a class. So in these two weeks, you have to work on these things. So you get a structure and you get some organization into starting your business. I think that was very important for me as we are thinking about starting a startup, wherein you don't know how it works sometimes. You don't know what you should be doing now. And the Sandbox Innovation Fund really helps with that. And talking a little bit more about the entrepreneurial sort of ecosystem here, so you have the Sandbox Innovation Fund. Once you do that, you graduate into, you can apply to MIT's Delta V, which is almost like a pitch day 
where you spend another say, a semester working on your idea and then you have investors coming in and you pitch your idea to them. There's also a 100K competition where you apply based on your idea and that you've developed through the Sandbox Fund to then win the 100K prize. More than the prize, it's the publicity you get of winning the MIT 100K that really accelerates your startup and the growth that you have. And the nucleus of all of this is the Trust Center at MIT, which is the Martin Trust Center for Entrepreneurship. And it's open to everyone. It's open 24 hours a day. You can just go in, sit with your team, work on things. It's the one place where you'll find me sitting most of the day. Even if it's just working, you can like reserve a room, sit and work with your team. If you want to write an assignment, there are tables that you can sit at. So it's a place where everyone meets. You meet outside of class socially there as well. And it's also where all of this entrepreneurship at Sloan sort of comes together. And for the energy conference, I worked as a volunteer, wherein we were helping get in some speakers for specific things around climate venture and climate investing, and then just managing the day-to-day for the three days that the event happened. Understood. And yeah. the conference was sort of like speakers, panels, workshops also? Not really workshops, mainly around speakers, panels, and a lot of time spent around Q&As and breakout rooms. But we didn't really do workshops this time because of time management and availability of facilitators. Understood. And yeah. switching gears to academics, can you speak a little about who the star professors are and what are the most popular electives? Sure. So I think in core, at Stone, you get an option to pick three electives. One out of four electives, you have marketing, corporate strategy, managerial finance. Yeah, those are the three. And one of those star professors here is Donald Skull, who takes the competitive strategy class which I couldn't get into the class because I was waitlisted. So I'm probably going to take it in the fall. But people who have taken it have nothing but great things to say about it. And it's a proper competitive strategy class that for people who want to get into consulting, it's a great exercise to understand how to evaluate companies. How do you think about entering markets with different products or even developing different products? Another great professor is Dana White. She teaches a core class called Organizational Processes. And it was one of my favorite classes through core semester, where you basically think of organizations from a cultural, political, and organizational lens, how that impacts organizations at different levels. So it's a very case-based, very case-heavy class, and Dana does an amazing job of orchestrating with that. There's also Professor Gita Rao in Impact Investing, which is a very in-demand elective, where you learn about venture capital, but impact-focused. The DEI focused, climate focused, or ESG, the governance piece of it, really focused on that kind of thing. Another very in demand elective is ID Lab, which I think is very unique to Sloan. It's called Individual Development Lab, and it has four facilitators who are all rock stars. And it's a semester where class is only three hours a week. It's really reflecting on your journey, your career your motivations and understanding what makes you who you are. You also get an executive coach for the semester who then helps you think about what your career goals are, who you are as a person and what you can change, improve, unlearn, relearn to reach those. So I think that'd be a class that I recommend highly and you can only take it in the first year. So yeah. That does sound like a phenomenal class. It's sort of like Taking your application process to the next level. Yeah, yeah. Taking your application to the next level. And the class is in groups of 30 people. So there are four classes, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. And you can be in one of the four classes with 30 people. And because you get so vulnerable and you get so open, that it helps really create this community of those 30 people where you learn so much about each other. Everyone's ambition, motivation, trials and tribulations and what they've gone through to be where they are and where they want to be. And I don't think I've experienced that in any other class. Lovely. And uh, we spoke a little bit about the action learning mm-hmm. labs. So how does one participate in a lab course? You know, is it competitive to get into these courses? And how long are the lab courses? And do they add value from a recruiting standpoint? Yeah, so... To answer your first question about how do you get into these courses? So the way MIT works is during the core in your first year, your schedule will be given to you. So you don't have to plan, you don't have to bid for courses. But starting the second semester, you get a thousand points and you have to bid for courses that you want. 
to take. And some courses are really hybrid courses like ID Lab, in, especially in the first year, is a very high demand course. You end up getting a lot of points on it, but you only have a thousand points. So labs generally tend to be mid to high bid depending on the kind of lab it is. And uh, it's like any other course. You join the class. Once you join the class, you get matched with a startup. I'm, I'm only talking about entrepreneurship lab that I'm doing right now. And I'm also doing engine lab. The engine is a VC in Cambridge. And the lab is specifically working with startups that are engine portfolio companies. And it's half MIT, half HBS. So the class is divided with half students from both schools. And we have two professors, one from IT, one from HBS. And the similar to Entrepreneurship Lab is just that the startups are a little more advanced in terms of their growth, funding, etc. So it's like any other class, you join it, you start working with the company. The company has a specific problem statement that they want your team to solve. And then you go through the class where you parallelly learn something about entrepreneurship or scaling a business or a tough tech venture and work on the company and helping them solve that problem for the semester. So that's how labs work. From a recruiting perspective, I think it's extremely helpful. While at school, I'm working with my VC fund in Bombay as a fellow. So I help them with sourcing. And working with these startups through the labs has really helped me get a greater experience in some way of being on the ground, working at a startup, understanding how they think about problems, how founders think about solving problems and the role VCs play. I'm on the other side of the table, so I know what VCs do and how it affects startups while working for them. So that has really helped me. Okay, very helpful. And uh, Suraj, want to talk about recruiting as well, right? Can you mm -hmm. speak about your internship recruiting experience? Yeah, absolutely. So at Sloan, uh, recruiting happens at different times for different industries. So in fall, a lot of recruiting happens for consulting and investment banking. And then now in February, we see a lot of VC, PE recruiting sort of pick up. Tech recruiting, I wasn't really involved in it. But from what I've seen with my friends, it happens sometimes late fall and then early spring. For me personally, I uh, decided to go through consulting recruiting at least for the internship. And it wasn't as bad as it was the year before, from what I've heard. It was extremely competitive for sure. But most people have ended up at the companies that they wanted to go to. Although there are a few where, because just the number of people and the condition of the market right now, the number of people being hired or offered isn't as high. So some people had to pivot out. But I wouldn't say it's been as bad as it was last year. Banking, from what I know, it was as good as it has been. It hasn't really seen downturn, really. Tech has seen some significant downturn. Uh, but although I think it's a function of being in Cambridge or at Sloan, most of my friends who are recruiting tech, if not big tech, have gotten great offers from startups in and around New York or the Boston area. VCPE, honestly, I have been pleasantly surprised with Sloan. The amount of inbound recruiting emails that we get from VCs and some private equity companies has been really surprising and honestly encouraging. And a lot of people are going into different kinds of investing, investing growth equity roles. Okay, that's interesting. And this includes international students? Yeah, but the only caveat here is generally for VCs or for private equity funds, they don't like sponsoring visas. So a lot of international students go for consulting or ID just so that they can underwrite their visa and have some safety around that and then spend the second year looking for opportunities where they could get sponsorship for full time. So that's also something that a lot of people do in terms of how they plan around internships and full times with the visa issue. Okay. And was that also a motivation for you? Not particularly because I genuinely enjoyed my time in consulting when I was doing it. And I haven't done it in a long time now and for the CDC. So for me, it was also, okay, let me do this for 10 weeks, see if I still love it the way I used to, and then I'm open to going back. And I have the opportunity here to work with startups and VCs through consulting. So I'll be in a different position where I'll be working at the meeting point of all these three VC startup and consulting space that I'm really excited about. Okay, that's pretty cool. And how does the career development office facilitate the recruiting outcomes? And maybe you can speak about other resources that you found helpful. Absolutely. So the CDO plays a huge role, I would say, in terms of getting access to verified opportunities that come on our CDO platform. They also have different events that talk about different things that you would require in your journey in recruiting, right? So yeah, how do you speak during an interview? Things like that, soft skills that are helpful. 
also professional clubs so for example if you're recruiting consulting you would be leaning more towards the management consulting club than the cdo because the cdo also pushes a lot of its resources through the management consulting club where you get a mentor to do cases with you get a case book you get access to what is happening in terms of coffee chats and events across fall semester for all the companies that you want to go to so it's almost like if you join the mcc and you're part of their programs you're an autopilot for consulting recruiting same goes for banking where the cdo pushes a lot through the banking club so it's almost autopilot you just have to do what they tell you to do and you hopefully will be able to get through so the way sloan thinks about it is highway dirt road and jungle recruiting So consulting in IB is called highway recruiting. Growth equity tech like startup is called dirt road, and VCP is generally under jungle recruiting. And I think it's quite self-explanatory in terms of getting through. So the highway part I just spoke about, dirt road, a lot of it also is on you, where you have to do a lot of outreach, speak to startups. There's no dirt in terms of the access you get to MIT to these startups, but it's a lot on you as well as the CDO support to get through some of these. Jungle recruiting VCs don't really like advertising jobs and neither do PEs. So it's completely up to your networking skills and you reaching out to different VCs to get in. And a lot of people have different strategies to do that. The CDO helps through career peers as well. So there are people who intern in VC or PE who will help you for second years, who will help you with your internship recruiting. And the thing with Dirt Road and Jungle is a lot of it happens in the last minute. So a lot of it is happening now in March, April, May. So you just have to be patient and trust that some things will come through when you see everyone around you getting consulting and IB offers. So yeah, yeah that's hard to maintain that confidence at that time. I bet. And uh, what do the numbers look like in terms of pay for management consulting when it comes to internships and when it comes to full time jobs? Sure. So for management consulting for internships, I would say the range of pay is between three to four thousand dollars a week. And for full time, I think with your signing bonus and bonus, it can go up to anywhere between two twenty to two eighty. That's for management consulting. For VC, it's a larger range depending on the kind of VC you go to. So I know that for internships in VCs, the weekly pay for the ten or twelve weeks is anywhere between fifteen hundred to twenty five hundred. And full time, you don't have a bonus in VC. It's mainly carry. So the base salary I would talk about in VC goes from one fifty to. Sometimes all the way to three hundred, based on the kind of VC you go to. Banking, I won't be able to comment on because I, I I don't know, but I think the range is similar to consulting. Okay, helpful. And Suraj, can you speak a little bit about how many Indian students you have in your class? And when I say Indians, I mean like from India with Indian passports. And, okay. And can you speak about where they're headed for their internships? Sure. Yeah. So I think at Sloan we have about. First year, eight to ten Indians who are Indian passport holders, and we are all headed in different directions. Some of us are going into consulting. Some of us are going into automotive industry. Like one of us is going into an automotive industry role. A lot going into tech. Some into IB as well. So there's no set industry as such, but it's all over the place. Uh, although the number of Indians from India is small compared to the class size, and uh, I think it's I don't know why Sloan does that, but. Yeah, I, yeah, I was going to ask you why do they do that, but I guess you yourself are wondering. We don't know. It's actually compared to other schools, it's the, the proportions quite low. Yeah, because most schools it's about ten percent, and yeah. it seems to be about a fourth of that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. And Suraj, now that you're about to complete a year, yeah, how would you sum up the year gone by, and how does it compare to your expectations? Wow. So if you come into good MBA program with a lot of expectations, and I, I think Sloan has delivered almost everything that I expected the program to be. Although I would caveat that by saying I didn't expect it to be as big as it is, and managing time is something that and has been a constant struggle, just in terms of social events, academics, and. Managing time across the three is extremely, extremely difficult. I know a lot of people say this. But I can't underscore it enough. So I came into the MBA not knowing what I really wanted to do, and with a very exploratory mindset. 
And luckily for me, Sloan is very conducive to that kind of thinking, wherein you have access to everything and anything that you want to do. And the school allows you to think of the whole school in a way as a sandbox. where You can build, fail, try again, try something else. And that to me has been fantastic. The community has been amazing. Like I've already made connections with people here who I know are going to last way beyond business school. And that's something that I, I really appreciate the school for doing. Where in the way they put you in core teams and different oceans it really helps you build a community. Even if you're an introvert, even if you don't like drinking and you don't want to go to those social events all the time, there's always something that you can do to meet people around you, to meet people who are like you or who think like you or who share your passions. That has been amazing for me. And from a career perspective, just the access that Sloan gives you to different industries, to different people. And uh, alumni have been super, super receptive and helpful. You can just email someone and say, hey, I'm exploring this industry and I want to just talk to you for half an hour. And I've never had anyone say that. So that has been great. Okay, nice. And if you could go back in time and change anything about the last year, right? What would that be? Wow. So if I could change anything about my last year at Sloan, I think one thing that I would do, and I'm I'm still not good at it, is learn to say no to a few things. Because you come in in your first year and you want to try everything and everyone has this weird sense of food, you don't want to miss out on a social event. You don't want to miss out on a conference. You don't want to miss out on a, I don't know, lunch and learn. And being okay with saying no and I just can't do it and prioritizing your health, your sleep, something else. Is something that I wish I knew coming in. Whoever I talk to who's coming into an MBA program, that's what I tell them. That it's okay to sometimes take some time to yourself. Yeah, makes sense. And do you guys have yeah. a weekly off as well? Uh, we don't have classes on Fridays. Okay, so that's your so we- weekly off. Weekly off. But there are a few classes that happen on Fridays, especially because as you go in from the second semester onwards, you have classes broken out into H3s and H4s, which are half semester classes. So if you have a half semester class, that's high credits. They will take class on Friday. But if you have a full semester class, there's no it is class on Friday. Okay. We get some time there as well then. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's nice. And Swaraj, before we end, do you have any final advice for prospective applicants or incoming MBA students to maximize their time in an MBA program? Yeah, I would say, firstly, before applying, don't self-reject yourself from what you hear online and through different communities of people. If you really think you're going to fit well into a school, make sure that you apply. Secondly, while choosing a school, talk to as many people as you can to see if the kind of people that are in that school are people that you gel with or are people that are thinking about life in a way at least similar to what you're thinking about. And then coming into business school, I would say come in with an open mind. Be ready to explore and do things that really stretch you and push you out of your comfort zone. Like for me, I feel like every month there's something happening at school and I'm like, I've never done this before. But you tend to do those things and you tend to push yourself. And I think that's what business school is all about. And also a lot of people come in with imposter syndrome and it's very common. You know, I had it coming into a big business school. Just know that everyone else is feeling the same. And you're all at the same place at the same time. So there's no need to be intimidated or be nervous at all. Okay. That's really helpful. Appreciate you sharing that, Raj. And thank you so much for the conversation. This was fantastic. I absolutely loved it and really appreciate your time. No, thank you so much, Nico. Thank you.